So we're going to get started. Welcome everyone to our bankruptcy and COVID event. On behalf of the Riverside Experience, we thank you for taking the time to join us for this webinar. We have a great discussion on tap featuring some of the industry's top experts in the field. This event is brought to you by the Riverside Experience and the Riverside family of companies. Riverside's motto is that they are more than just a title company. They are your partner in helping you get your deals done. When everyone else says no, Riverside says yes. While others are pulling back, Riverside is fully up and running, getting things done for their clients. Whether it's their top rated title services, 1031 exchanges, cost segregation, Riverside is there for you. Riverside even has a soft deposit fund that can help their clients put offers on new deals without tying up their money. And now we turn the program over to our moderator led by David, David Goldwasser. David, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. And uh, thank you to Riverside for uh, sponsoring and hosting this event. Or, uh, a lot of people, uh, as I speak to people at Riverside, have had questions uh, regarding bankruptcy, as you know, we get many questions on a daily basis. To, you know, how does bankruptcy work? And uh, you know, how can it help me? So we came up with uh, creating this panel of people who are very, very involved, attorneys who are very involved in uh, the bankruptcy world uh, in order to try and educate everybody as to what's going on in the bankruptcy world and how it might affect you and your properties. Uh, we have on our esteemed panel, uh, Laurie Schwartz from the firm of Robinson Brog. Uh, she's a partner there in the business finance restructuring department. She works uh, on mainly on Chapter 11 reorganizations, representing the debtors uh, on, for, for the most part. And she's been involved in many, many cases alongside of myself uh, with, with the entire legal team over at Robinson Brog uh, and has a lot of experience uh, navigating a lot of the complex parts of the bankruptcy part of the bankruptcy process. Uh, additionally, we have Kevin Nash, uh, who is an attorney at Goldberg Weprin, Finkel Goodstein, LLP. Uh, he has been a long-standing uh, practitioner of bankruptcy law and a very big force uh, of, for, for debtors uh, and, and as well for creditors and has a tremendous amount of experience. Uh, again, I've worked with him myself in my bankruptcy proceedings, uh, both against him and with him. So I know both sides of, uh, of, of Mr. Nash's uh, good side and his uh, other good side. Uh, finally, we have uh, Jason Naji, uh, who is a member of Palzanelli. Uh, he works in the financial services uh, litigation and restructuring group as well. Uh, one of the reasons for bringing Jason, uh, other than he's a good friend and has also worked for me uh, on many cases, is that Jason more so represents creditors and lenders and, you know, for a long time has represented special servicers. Uh, in regards to CMBS loans, as well as other large uh, institutional investors. So he has a different take on it than the people who mainly represent uh, debtors or borrowers, as a lot of the people who are watching are property owners who might be in a position to have to be there. So he, he's really giving us a view from the other side of the curtain, from the institutional side, and, and can answer the questions with a different mindset than the people who uh, are really representing the debtors for the most part. Um, well, very, very well experienced uh, in, in this industry, and I think will give a lot of insight to many people who do not have uh, that much knowledge of bankruptcy. About myself a little bit, uh, I've been involved as a chief restructuring officer and a workout person uh, for the past approximately 15 years. Uh, I have confirmed over 33 bankruptcy proceedings as a debtor. I've been involved in almost 50 bankruptcy proceedings from uh, including some creditor uh, work. So I, I've been around the business for a very long time. And uh, that's why we have this panel convened here today to try to help people who you know, have some questions um, or wanna understand a little bit more because of all of the uncertainty that is going on today. Um, as we go through and I ask some questions of the panel, uh, anybody who has a question on any of the different uh, topics, please feel free to hit uh, in the question and answer uh, and either we'll answer it during the uh, 
um, during the discussion, or we might bring it to the end if it's a more general question. Uh, so uh, I'll start off with uh, ladies first. We'll ask Mrs. Uh, um, Lori, in your experience, uh, you know, what brings somebody to have to file a chapter 11 in a generality as a property owner, really specifically, because that's, you know, most of our, uh, mm -hmm. most of our watching base at the moment. Sure. Well, you know, my experience uh, is often on an emergency basis, and I'm sure that Kevin has had similar experiences in terms of parties coming to us who are at the end of their rope. There's a foreclosure proceeding pending, uh, potentially a UCC foreclosure sale pending, and they need the benefit of the bankruptcy forum to get the automatic stay so that they can get their house in order and restructure that secured obligation and emerge from bankruptcy. What we've seen lately is that that often ends up in a sale scenario rather than a restructuring scenario. Uh, and it seems to be the pattern in a lot of the big chapter 11 cases that have been filed recently during the COVID pandemic, but it's unclear. And I would actually be curious to hear Jason's position as someone on the secured creditor side, um, how those creditors view these filings and the eventual exit, if sales are going to be the answer, or if there's going to be a negotiation to restructure those secured obligations going forward. Um, so I, I would, I would, my view is as follows. Before COVID, property, people understood what the, the value of property was. You could look at a building, you could look at its bones, you could look at what the rent rolls were, you could look at the incomes around it, particularly in, in the New York and New Jersey area, but you could do that across the country. You can't do that anymore. <clears throat> and while I haven't had specific conversations with creditors, um, the eviction moratoriums, New York City's rent regulation that they revised and the the problems that you have with with a, the base that you need for tenants to create the stability that you have and the the legal processes issues that you have because of so many of the state's covid regulations has thrown a lot of uncertainty into the mix and lenders have are still looking around and they're still trying to get a feel for it but I can tell you that if, if you talk to appraisers and appra an appraiser that's looking at, at the, let's call it the retail industry or, or the, the services industry, they're assuming that you don't get back to normal for two to, for I think three to four years. So there's my, my view, I think, which is really, it's anecdotal, but I, I suspect that lenders are gonna be much more willing to work out a deal depending on the property. Um, I found that lenders are much more willing to work out a large amalgamation of, of assets. Let's say there's assets that are, it's 10 different properties in, in New Jersey, for example, or, or a, a vacation area in another state. You're going to see a lot more willingness for, for sales on an individual basis. Servicers, lenders don't want to take back properties that, were, that have a lot of management issues and require a lot of expenditures just to own the asset, particularly when you have such uncertainty on the rent rolls and the net operating income that's going to come in from the property. Kevin, you have any uh, take on yeah, that? I have a wholly different view on, on, on the whole thing. And that, I, I, I think... Uh, that's usually I Kevin think, was different than everybody else's. I think uh, what Lori said is is unfortunately m most of the time that uh, a bankruptcy in a real estate context is filed on an emergency basis. It's filed just before a foreclosure sale and it's usually filed a day before a sale. And so I think when you file it on an emergency basis, uh, you're already uh, swimming upstream in, in the bankruptcy court because it looks like an act of desperation. I think the better play is uh, to file a chapter 11 early on in the foreclosure process where your uh, options are, are, are more varied and where you can go into the bankruptcy court looking to restructure the underlying debt in a way that you're not locked into a foreclosure judgment. You might have various defenses that you can raise uh, to help you uh, uh, modify and restructure debt. And waiting too long is always a problem in my mind 
because I, I, I think it's a, a red flag. Now, I, I understand most cases are filed that way. People are reticent about filing bankruptcy. Uh, one of the questions I always get is, if I file a bankruptcy and I'm associated with a bankruptcy, am I ever gonna qualify for another mortgage? So most real estate operators are very sensitive to that. Uh, what I usually do in those situations, I usually bring in a third party manager, a restructuring person uh, who signs the petition and I try to isolate the equity holder from, from the uh, uh, stigma of a chapter 11. But I think if you're gonna be successful, the quicker you get into a bankruptcy court, after a default, the better off you are. And it gives you more flexibility and it gives you more of an opportunity uh, to deal with potential offsets and, and counterclaims and, and what have you. Because at the end of the day, you're fighting a lender, and if the lender's holding a judgment, he's got the upper hand. Okay. Uh, within that vein of filing while you're in the foreclosure process, you know, right now, one of the topics that we're discussing and one of the reasons we're having the webinar is that, you know, we are in the middle of the COVID pandemic, uh, and there are a lot of different properties which are not receiving cash flow outside of multifamily, which, you know, we've been getting reports that most of the people are paying. Uh, and again, that I, I would say geographical sense would be different in different places, but across the board nationwide, I think the reports is close to 80% of tenants are paying. Uh, but, you know, we, we know that many retailers, uh, famous retailers have, you know, gone bankrupt. Uh, a lot of people own shopping centers across the country uh, and they're not getting paid their rent. And, you know, due to that, uh, as well as the rest of the scare of retail, the values of the properties have gone down. So now they have no cash flow or very little cash flow. Uh, they can't service their debt. Their lenders are not sure what to do. And, uh, you know, the borrower has an issue. Is that sometime that we would file a bankruptcy or is that, do you suggest from the restructuring perspective, you know, what do you guys suggest? And uh, I'll throw that to Kevin first. Well, what, I, what I've been doing is uh, I've been negotiating under these uh, pre-negotiation agreements uh, to try to do what I call, like we're doing a virtual uh, seminar to do a virtual bankruptcy because we know how the bankruptcy is gonna run. And so I take the pre-negotiation agreement. I try to eliminate any acknowledgement of the validity of the debt as best as I can. I try to reserve under the pre-negotiation agreement what I consider COVID-19 related defenses. That has to do with impossibility, frustration, the purpose, uh, and, and everything associated with the pandemic, which is a justification for not paying. Uh, you put together uh, a business plan and projections based upon, you know, actual values that you understand have been reduced anywhere between 20 to 30 to 40 percent, diminished cash flow, and you sit down with your lenders and try to get changes in uh, financial covenants, try to get uh, deferment. Uh, nobody's really abating, but they are deferring uh, certain payments. And you have to be sensitive to, you know, your debt uh, uh, coverage ratios and all the not uh, financial covenants. But if you put it together and you have a lender on the other side that is, is realistic, I think you can get a lot accomplished. Now, I would always do that in advance of, of, of a bankruptcy because once you go into Chapter 11 as a single asset case, although the courts are sensitive to COVID-19, there's some basic rules that they're bound by. One of the rules that you got to be careful of is that within 90 days of a, of a single asset real estate filing, you either have to have a plan or start paying uh, adequate protection, which is usually debt service. So you're kind of bound up by that type of rule so the more you can get accomplished uh, before bankruptcy with a lender, uh, I think that that uh, keeps you in, in better stead during the bankruptcy. You always got to keep an eye on the fact that the automatic stay stops a foreclosure, but you do have obligations once you're in Chapter 11 at some level to start paying something 
and uh, certainly you have to pay taxes. You got to insure the property and everybody has a story, but at the end of the day, you, you need some operating cash flow to be successful. Okay. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Now, you know, there are many, I, would, I wouldn't call them myths, but many things that people talk about when it comes to bankruptcy. Uh, one of them is uh, talking about stopping default interest. Uh, you know, Lori, uh, can you explain when default interest, uh, stop the stopping of default interest would apply under a bankruptcy or when it wouldn't? Right. So there's a, there's a few issues there. And this goes back to one of Kevin's earlier comments, which is um, pre-judgment, you're still operating under the terms of the governing loan documents, which are certainly going to have a default provision and a default interest provision. You want to be in a position where you can fight whatever default the lender is claiming so you can avoid that entirely. But once you file a bankruptcy, default interest is going to be dependent upon the value of the property. And that goes to the comment that Jason was making before. So uh, it could be that you have to pay default interest, or it could be that it stops as of the petition date. Again, dependent on the value of the property and if there's some sort of equity cushion that you can utilize in the bankruptcy to avoid having to make those payments. So you're saying that if you have equity in the property, then the ability to charge default interest would potentially be applicable uh, right. based upon the loan documents. It all goes back to the loan documents. Just because you're, that's important to remember that just because you're in a bankruptcy doesn't mean that the loan documents are no longer the governing documents. That once you're in a bankruptcy, however, you do get the benefit of the automatic stay, at least for a period of time, as Kevin indicated, when it comes to single asset real estate, where the lender cannot uh, take any further action without getting bankruptcy court approval. That doesn't mean that they can't fight it and say that there's cause to lift the automatic stay, but you do have those protections in a bankruptcy that you wouldn't have outside of a bankruptcy, but for if you are doing some sort of pre-negotiation, some sort of forbearance, something where the lender has agreed to uh, not proceed with that kind of a litigation. Now, I, I don't know what the uh, Tolling is currently on foreclosures. Uh, Governor Cuomo enacted a variety of protections that limited lenders from pursuing foreclosures. Uh, that does not cover UCC foreclosures. That's something we can talk about separately, but that's also something that I think has limited what I, I assume is going to be a, a huge rash of filings once that deadline is no longer, or once that tolling expires and lenders are able to proceed. Well, let me, let me just weigh in on that. There's a couple of yeah. good points here that people should be aware of. On the default interest side, very, very interesting. It, it, it is dependent on value, but one of the key decisions you make in the Chapter 11 before you file is whether or not there is equity in the property, how much equity is available, and it's an interesting thing. If, if the property goes to a judgment of foreclosure before a bankruptcy, then the default interest in the mortgage technically is merged into the judgment and the post-petition interest rate is at the legal rate of 9% because you don't really have a mortgage anymore as a matter of law. Everything's merged in. So you always see mortgages with crazy, and I consider them crazy, 24% interest on default, 6 8%, even less on a non-default. So the disparity is very great. So, and you can get killed with default interest within a year of a bankruptcy if it's ticking. So there is a benefit, as I said, you don't wanna go in there on a day before a foreclosure sale, but there is some benefit of having a judgment of foreclosure if you have no defenses with with a lender and it's 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 really a question of staying off or buying time to get get some type of sale going or refinancing it's not terrible to have a judgment of foreclosure because that at least minimizes the default interest uh, and so you have to make a decision on that. The second point Lori made on, on, on the tolling uh, under the COVID restrictions 
as I understand it, the, the date now to notice foreclosure sales is October 15th. That, that was under uh, an executive order in July. However, I, I still think you can file a foreclosure action now, uh, and, but you just can't go to sale between now and, and October 15th. As to the UCC pr provisions, case came out uh, last week, interesting case, Supreme Court, New York County, where they did link the UCC Article 9 on a mezzanine loan foreclosure they did link it to the equivalent of a, of a real property foreclosure, and there was a stay on, on that until October 15th. There's been cases that go both ways on that, but it was an interesting case last week that did stay on, on, on Article 9 mezzanine loan type of sale. So when you're thinking about bankruptcy real estate, obviously you're thinking about value, and you're thinking about interest rate, and you're thinking about cash flow, and whether you have those three things to make a deal with lenders. Jason, you were going to say something? So, so two things um, um, about Kevin's point with respect to the, the judgment of foreclosure. It, you do get the 9% on the judgment. However, typically what happens is you get all of the default interest applied as part of the judgment. So you're getting 9% on your post default interest. So it really does depend sir, on, on, the, on the underlying circumstances as to whether or not it's better to have a judgment of foreclosure or not. Because if your interest tick on the entirety of all of the interest owed and all of the advances um, at 9% is greater than the 24% or the 18% default interest, that's going to be determining factor as to whether or not you're better off. Um, and in, in a number of my cases, I've been much better because I've had the judgment of foreclosure because I was getting 9% over a period of years. And the interest rate that was ticking at 9% was better. Um, the judgment rate was, was better than the 24% or the 18% default interest rate. Um, with respect to the timing of foreclosures, you've been able to bring a foreclosure um, for, for a, a bit now. The, what, the, what the state courts have done in New York is they said that all you could do is bring the action. They said you couldn't seek to obtain, um, you couldn't make any motions up until recently. Um, I think it was up until July 23rd, unless the property was both vacant and abandoned. So you could file for relief, but you couldn't do much else. Now, at, as of July 24th, what the, what the state court orders have, have permitted is you can have, you, you can make motions, you can do all the things that you want, but first the court has to have a settlement conference. Um, well, they, they call it, it's, it's a conference and a settlement conference combined. It's very unclear. Um, but I've now had judges that have entered default judgments on us because there was no one there on the other side and they're appointing referees to compute. So it's starting to open up. Um, and Kevin was right that what they what the the most recent order does is it bans foreclosures, um, foreclosure auctions from occurring until October 15th, and it directs the administrative judges for each of the districts within the state of New York to determine to provide procedures for the safe conduct of auctions. Um, now, finally, Kevin is correct that there was a recent decision about mezzanine for about um, UCC foreclosures. I like to call them UCC sales because I think the judge was wrong and it was an incorrect decision when you liken a uniform commercial code sale to a foreclosure. There are two very different remedies. You have different types of collateral. Um, and right now there are two decisions. There's, there's one decision um, from, the Supreme, from the Supreme Court, New York County that says that the current the current forbearances or banning of 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 foreclosures does not prevent ucc sales and then the newer one that came out last week does prevent ucc sales in reality it's not going to matter much because it looks like the courts are going to be opening up the process to have foreclosure sales as of october 15th and the decisions and the conflict between the two will not be decided by them so and it, depending, it depends on the judge that you get and, and your circumstances, if you have a mezzanine loan, whether you'll be able to foreclose on the UCC. But the one thing you can guarantee is that any borrower <clears throat> is, going to, is going to file a TRO before you have your, your UCC sale regardless. 
it would almost be malpractice to not do that. Jason, um, one of the questions that's come up on the board uh, is asked, the question is, what about good guy guarantee provisions that can subject the principal to personal liability? You know, so, you know, many times we've seen in loan documents that there's some type of a uh, springing guarantee uh, within the loan documents uh, that trigger a personal guarantee. Uh, in your experience representing lenders specifically, how many times has that, how many times have you been involved in actually going after the guarantees due to somebody filing a bankruptcy? And do you actually use that or is it more of a threat that's in the papers? I use it, but, but so there, there are a couple of things when you talk about, they call them springing recourse guarantees. They call them good guy guarantees. Um, they've done a couple of things. Their use in the last cycle prevented the long drawn out bankruptcy process that, that for decades had supported an entire ecosystem of very sophisticated individuals. So what the function of a good guy guarantee, what it does is it, it prevents it prevents people from filing bankruptcies. It prevents people from contesting foreclosures because there's no personal liability that, that attaches. However, whenever I've been in a situation where someone has sprung the recourse guarantee or, they, or, or there's a violation of the good guy guarantees, we go after them. And quite frankly, um, it makes for a much nicer process because you have a cooperating lender and a cooperating borrower there are plenty of times where lenders are frustrated because they don't have a guarantor to go after, but it does get them the collateral faster. So they are used, they're very important. And as much as um, people don't, don't like them because it limits your options in bankruptcies, it's a big benefit to borrowers too, because it limits their liability. Kevin, you have any experience? Yeah, with I have a lot of experience on it. So here, here's the bottom line. You got my sound and no. Yes, I said, I don't think there's anything you don't have a lot of experience okay, on. Okay, so here, here's the bottom line on this. Obviously, it's a chilling effect when you're a principal and you have a marginal property. And if you go into Chapter 11, now you're going to take a marginal property and go recourse debt. It gives you reason to pause. There's no doubt about it. But there's ways to, to fight that uh, triggering event of, of a guarantee. Under New York state law, there's an election of remedies. So if you start a foreclosure, you're usually precluded from suing the guarantor until the end of the foreclosure, and then you can only sue them for a deficiency. In chapter 11, there's a provision called 105, which gives you the opportunity uh, as, a, as a debtor to protect the principal by getting expanding the automatic stay to cover the principal uh, to the extent that the principal is going to uh, fund certain aspects of the plan and he shouldn't be uh, subject to uh, state court litigation. So there are ways to defend it. It's not, uh, it's not uh, necessarily uh, a death knell to file a bankruptcy with a, with a springing guarantee. I call them bad boy guarantees because in the lender's eye, the worst thing you can do uh, to a lender is to file a chapter 11. Now, the reason that's the worst thing you can do is because in chapter 11, the lender's not necessarily in control. It's an even playing field. Uh, judges are sensitive to debtors. They wanna help usually debtors navigate chapter 11. So the reason lenders hate chapter 11 is because it kind of works against them in, in, in bankruptcy. So what I, would, what I would say, and I do say to, to clients, is if you believe in the property and you believe there's an opportunity to salvage the property and there's, there's equity there, you're gonna be covered anyway. And so it's worth the gamble if you believe in your property to, to address it. And so uh, I wouldn't be scared off by it. I would, I would be cautious, but I would certainly wouldn't be scared off by a springing guarantee uh, because it takes years to enforce. And in most bankruptcy cases, it's, it's negotiated, it's resolved. And when I say most, nine out of 10 are negotiated and resolved and, 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 and the liability goes away by, through a restructuring. So I, I, I tell people, <laughs> If you believe in your property, try to save it, and I'll try to save you in the process. But Kevin, I want to ask you a question 
right now we've seen a wave of secondary market buyers for the you know these large uh, pools of distressed asset funds. Uh, I personally have seen them treating the process differently, and they are more. Um, they have been going after guarantees much more vigorously. So you know you might start off with an institutional approach from a lender but then you could end up with one of these, we'll call it vulture buyers, who you know, doesn't have the same scruples uh, as an institutional lender and be, uh, a different outcome. What do you think about that? Well, but let's talk about practically. Okay, so you, you have somebody that's gonna forsake a foreclosure and is gonna go against the guarantor. Yes. So what do they do? They file a summons and complaint in state court. It takes, months if not years to even come close to dealing with to to be in a position to file a motion for summary judgment and so forth in the interim if you put the property into chapter 11 you can use all these benefits of 105 restructuring to deal with it so the state court process sounds sounds scary but it, it, it it's so long and attenuated that it, it really gives the borrower enough time that he can react properly, file a chapter 11, try to save his property, he can defend against in state court, and, and he's gonna have the time to do so because the state court pre-COVID was, was slow. Post-COVID, they're beyond slow. Why? Because they don't run, they don't function normally anymore. Uh, it's hard to even get through the door to go into court. Everything is remote. Uh, you file an order to show cause, it can sit there literally for days, if not weeks, before it's signed, and they just don't have the manpower, the personnel to deal with it. So, even if they want to sue you uh, out of the box, you pop, you file an answer, you raise defenses, whatever they may be, and then you go, then you go forward, and you see what's in the best interest of your property. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I'm going to ask everybody who's. Uh, watching this for CLE credits, you should write down the word bankruptcy. The code word is bankruptcy, uh, which a CLE provider will request you give them that uh, word in order to get your credits. Uh, Lori, I'm gonna ask you a question. Um, you know, in being in the bankruptcy world uh, and practicing as much as you have, you know, people continue to ask me, oh, you must be very busy. There must be millions of bankruptcies being filed. And, you know, because in the news, you hear about this retailer and that retailer. But, you know, what are you seeing in relation to real estate bankruptcies? Uh, you know, I have not seen a very large uptick. I've seen in a more specific situation, but I've not seen a large uptick. What, what are you guys seeing over at Robinson Brock? Uh, that's been my experience as well, and I think it goes to what Kevin was saying earlier, that pre-negotiating, negotiating with your lender, trying to work something out with your lender without having to file the bankruptcy is, I think, a path that a lot of people should choose and, and will choose, especially in this environment, because it makes the most sense. Obviously, bankruptcy is always an option if things go south, if the negotiations aren't working out but you do have to have an exit on the other side and that can be very challenging in this circumstance. Um, you know, there's been a lot of retail filings. We all know that. Uh, we've been busy with uh, landlord matters more so than chapter 11 debtor side matters right now. Could you elaborate on the landlord matters so that, you know, some of the people watching could understand a little better. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part of your question. Could you elaborate on what that means by landlord matters. Sure. So to the extent that a retail entity, you know, J. Crew, Brooks Brothers, uh, Steinmark filed, anyone who has is the landlord on a lease is going to be monitoring those cases. Uh, the, what I've seen in, in a lot of those cases, especially because of COVID and the shutdowns and there being no retail, is that the judges have often deferred, not waived or abated, as Kevin said, rent but they are certainly giving debtors the opportunity to uh, defer those payments. And as landlords, you need to fight for their rights because the landlords don't want to be the ones who are financing the chapter 11. Normally they would have to be paid in a chapter 11 as an administrative creditor. So that's where we've been the busiest right now, but I do anticipate a wave, as I said earlier, 
of more single asset real estate or real estate focused uh, debtor work in October. Well, so, so dovetailing on that, Jason, um, representing the special services that you do, uh, or that your firm does, and that you're involved in, these bankruptcies, which are, um, which, as Laurie said, they're working on the landlord side. Um, do, do at any point these bankruptcy trigger provisions under the loan docs that you guys represent that would then uh, initiate some type of an action on behalf of the lender? Well, if, if you have key tenant provisions in as, as, a, as a part or a next to your loan agreements and you know the, your, your largest tenant, which had 50% of the occupancy um, files bankruptcy or stops paying rent, and that's a default, then you technically have a default. But everyone understands on the lender side right now what's going on. They understand the issues with value, with, with, with tenants of all kinds, and lenders are being very careful and considerate in, in dealing with, let's say, ish, defaults or potential defaults. They may, they may send you a notice, but they're gonna try to work with you because quite frankly, unless you're at the very, you've been at the edge for a while you, or, or, or you, you have, you've been in default for a while, everyone understands that we're all dealing with a new universe. And so this is the most I've seen lenders be is from an empathetic perspective. Um, they understand what's going on. And while they don't feel your pain because this is a business relationship, they've been very much aware and sensitive to it. Okay. Um, I, I should get Jason's lenders because every lender I know doesn't feel any pain other than their own pain that they can't pay investors or they can't make a return. Uh, I think it's all window dressing. They wanna push you for money and you gotta push back. And, and any area of good feelings to me is, is, is hyperbole. Lenders will always be lenders, whether it's COVID or not COVID. So uh, maybe I, I, should, I should meet some, some nicer lenders. Everyone I know, they're looking to burn my borrowers. Well, I, you know, that, that brings what I was saying before about the you know, distressed debt funds, where they're not really lenders. You know, and some of the hard money lenders or high interest lenders are not really lenders per se as the institutional lenders that Jason's represent. And, I, and that's why I asked the question before about the bad boy guarantees and, and the personal guarantees is that there's a difference when you, the person on the other side is an institution or they're the ones really making decisions. And as you just stated, Kevin, they have to answer to their investors. And those investors are actually calling them. They're not doing earnings reports on a quarterly basis and you know, have boards and whatnot. Um, you know, so one, one of the things that, uh, another thing that's going on right now, which I, I don't know that everybody understands, the bankruptcy courts have never closed, where we had closures of a lot of state courts across the country and you know, definitely in New York, one of the largest court systems that's been closed. Uh, the bankruptcy courts have never stopped, maybe for a couple of days. Uh, Not even for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. So, well, I, Open I was, for business. Right. Um, which, which is unique amongst all the other courts. And, you know, we've been having virtual hearings either telephonically uh, and or with video. You know, how has that experience been for you? And let's start with Lori. Well, we've always, or in most cases, you have had the ability to appear telephonically at a regular a status conference or a hearing where you're not uh, dealing with evidence and, and testimony. So it's not that unique other than the fact that everyone is calling in from their home rather than their offices or the judge is not you know, in the courtroom or in chambers. Um, in terms of regular hearings, that has been a smooth process. I've not had any issues. I have not yet had a scenario where I've had a witness situation or some sort of contested litigation where it was trial by Zoom. I know that Judge Drain has held a number of hearings. I know, David, you were involved in one of those hearings. Uh, some of my colleagues have been dealing with them. And while it is certainly more complicated and you need to be up to speed on the technological side of it, uh, I have not seen many problems in terms of moving things forward, which has been important for the process so that these cases can get to conclusion. 
I mean, I, you know, I, I personally, you know, I had a five day Zoom trial last week where we had, I believe, 10 witnesses and the process was very smooth outside of getting the witness binders. You know, some of, some of the logistics were a little harder to start with, but the process was, was relatively smooth. Uh, you know, in some respects, I think that there's been more movement due to the fact that you could work with many more participants and schedule things a lot easier uh, being telephonically. Uh, Kevin, what, what do you feel about that? I, I love it. I really do. I love, uh, I can make four, five, six court appearances uh, and never get out of my gym shorts. I think it's a great thing. And uh, I used to open up, uh, uh, you know, I used to never, I never asked this question of a judge, what are you wearing? But in the early days of COVID, I said, what are you wearing? Most of them weren't dressed either. So uh, it's very, it's very, very convenient. Uh, once you get the hang uh, of a Zoom trial, it's like a regular trial. You see the people, you hear what they're saying. Uh, but I think it's great. It saves a lot of time in the sense that, you know, you're not commuting back and forth from your office. You're on, you're on, you can do work while you're waiting to have your case called. And I think, quite frankly, it's going to be the wave of the future. I do see courts using video more uh conference calls more it's just convenient uh for everyone now the best thing about going to court though is you can make deals in the hallway correct and and, and a bankruptcy is about making deals in a hallway so when you're on zoom there's no hallway and so you lose a, a little of that uh, you lose a little momentum in cases because you don't have that personal uh, exchange but from a technical point of view, business can be uh, conducted by Zoom. Confirmation hearings can have, contested hearings can be had, and uh, the regular basic calendar certainly can be had uh, by conference calls. So it has a lot of good features to it. I don't think it's hurt anybody. And I know the bankruptcy court is proud of the fact that they were always open for business and they have conducted business. Uh not really relating to bank specifically, but does any of the, any of the three of you have an idea why the other court systems didn't do this at the same time? Well, the district court definitely did. Okay, the circuit courts are having arguments by by Zoom. The appellate divisions are having arguments by Zoom. What, and I, and what, what happens in the state court, which people don't really understand? Yes, everything is electronically filed but the state court needs clerks to process papers for judges because the state docket is, is, is so voluminous. And it took a little while. They have a big union, a public uh, union that, that was very adamant, people not traveling into courthouses. Uh, state courts have a lot of people, so nobody was in a courthouse. So it, it, so it hampered state court judges in the, in the early stages, March, April, into May. From, from, from participating fully. But now they've gotten that system down. The state judges always say they got a bad, uh, bad reputation that they were as, as good as anybody else. But right now, as we sit here going into Labor Day, most, most courts are, are open uh, for full business. They handle a lot of things. Trials will though, trials will have to wait a little bit in the state courts. But uh, other than that, they're all good for business. Okay. Uh, Lori, you, you had mentioned earlier about having a plan. And Kevin alluded to this also in some of his comments. Uh, you know, we all understand what that means because we do this on a daily basis. Could you explain what having a plan means? Not specifically the technical aspects of the plan per se, but you know, what a plan includes and what it accomplishes? So in order to emerge from a chapter 11 bankruptcy, you have to have your plan confirmed. And the plan is what's going to establish who's gonna get paid what. And that is obviously the key to getting your lender paid, getting your taxes paid, getting your unsecured creditors paid. Uh, there's all sorts of 
detail and, and specifics that I, I won't go into in terms of the bankruptcy code and, and the priorities, but the bottom line is that often, especially in an emergency, especially when you're trying to stop a foreclosure, you file a bankruptcy to get the benefit of the stay, but you have no way to restructure. You have no way to get out. And that's why it's important to consider these things and hopefully not move on an emergency basis, as, as Kevin mentioned, so that you can figure out how you can come out as a new entity, pay off your obligations in accordance with the plan, and get your fresh start, for lack of a better word. Um, if you can't confirm your plan, your case is going to get dismissed, and you're basically back in the same boat as you were prior to filing your petition. That may mean your foreclosure goes forward. Uh, that may mean a number of other things happen. Um, sometimes cases just don't work out and you end up negotiating that in your chapter 11, whether it be by a voluntary dismissal or uh, you know, a deed in lieu of foreclosure or whatever it is. But if you have a, no ability to, to finance your obligations outside of the bankruptcy, you're gonna have a very hard time once you file figuring out how to do that. So, you know, one of the things that people, again, we'll call it a myth versus legend uh, theory is that people think they're going to file bankruptcy and all of a sudden the lender is going to cry and they're going to beg them uh, to leave bankruptcy. Jason, do your lenders cry and beg people to leave because somebody files bankruptcy? I love it when people file bankruptcy. It's, it's much more involved and interesting because when you're in foreclosure, you're pretty much sitting and waiting. Um, there's very, I've never run in to, as a lender, I've never run into a situation where someone has filed affirmative defenses that have been a bar to anything. And the reality is that the affirmative defenses are, um, are not even litigated because by the time you get to the judgment of foreclosure and sale portion, there's really, I have a receiver in place and the cash flow isn't going to the borrower, the borrower to fund whatever it is that they would normally use the cash flow to fund, um, legal defenses, you name it. So lenders don't cry. I don't cry. Um, there are some things you have to be aware of and you have to be careful of. But to me, I'm happy when, when we hit bankruptcy because the steps are fairly straightforward. You're going to have to start making adequate protection payments, as Kevin mentioned, in the first 90 days. And so we're going to negotiate over that, but we'll have a cash collateral order that, that I like that'll make sure that my client gets paid. If all of a sudden the, net, the, the cash flow stops, I'll be able to move to lift the automatic stay. If I want to push you, I could move to lift the automatic stay, and then we'll negotiate a consensual plan. So there's a lot of things that, that, that borrowers can do but lenders aren't without remedy as well. And as long as you know how to operate, whether, whether I've got someone like Lori or Kevin on the other side, I'm comfortable because there is a pathway. And the one thing that you're not gonna get in the vast majority of bankruptcy cases is three years to reorganize a single asset real estate case. There's, there's really only a couple of exits out and you see fairly quickly where the case is going. So. From my perspective, there's a little bit of danger there, but there's also the promise of, of, of an actual resolution that's gonna happen um, sooner rather than later. Well, Kevin, you know, many times I hear people say <clears throat> when they're talking about trying to resolve, I'm gonna hire Kevin Nash and he'll show you. So, you know, why do people say that, Kevin? Are you that scary? Uh, I'll tell you why, yes. okay? <laughs> I'll tell you why. It's not that I'm scary, and it's not that uh, I have any, you know, earth-shattering understanding of bankruptcy that nobody else has. We all have the same understanding. But it does come down in many respects to personality, relationships, and, you know, a familiarity with the court system and the judges. So uh, when Jason says I'm not scared about bankruptcy, the real question is who's the judge and where are you in the process and who's the lawyer on the other side? Because at the end of the day, bankruptcy is about negotiation and you litigate a little bit. You always have to litigate a little bit, but you do it with a view of being in a position to negotiate. 
And so what I think I can do is I can, I can raise issues, create a, a platform of litigation with an eye towards negotiation. And, and I think judges give me that opportunity because at the end of the day, I'm not crazy. I know it has to be done. Well, that's up for the debate. That's up for the debate. It's a, it's a debatable problem, but I know it has to be done. And I try to guide my clients towards what I think, you know, a judge is looking for. Judge is looking for credibility. You got to be you only, you have to be credible going into chapter 11. You can't misuse rents. You can't neglect paying taxes. You can't have the property uninsured. Um, and, and you got to be able to, to put a plan together. Now, Laurie says it's got a lot of technical aspects, but there's one thing every plan has that people, you know, lose sight of the fact. It needs money. And you have to keep your eye on the ball from day one that you're not getting out of chapter 11 without some new money, some new approach with money. And if you go in there with those, those, those basic uh, uh, premises that you have to be credible, you have to run the case properly, you have to respect what the United States trustee wants in terms of operating reports and quarterly fees. You got to respect the lender because they, you know, You'll have, you'll have a, a, a better way with a lender if you're making some payments and you're going to get credibility with the court if, if the court sees that you're moving towards bringing in new money, moving towards a sale, bringing the case to resolution because the judges have to resolve cases and they look to lawyers to help them do that. So you just can't go in there and figure it out after the fact. You got to have a little bit of of a game plan going into a chapter 11. And this is not hard stuff, it's real estate. I mean, you either sell the property, refinance, or let it go. But okay. can, can, you know, can somebody come in with what people call rescue capital? Can, can a new participant come in to put up money in order to, to make the case work? Yes, that's a, that's, that's a viable, you know, new, uh, you know, new investor money is always helpful. Uh, they want control of the property for that. But at the end of the day, if a principal is looking at being shut out, you know, he would cede control to new money. Uh, so that's a possibility. Refinance is a possibility. And, and obviously a sale of the property is a possibility. Now you did have on your agenda about the transfer tax savings. Yes. Which I think, you know, is a, is a side benefit to a chapter 11. Uh, that can be very valuable for debtors. It can be very valuable for lenders. If you do it right and you you sell a piece of property in Chapter 11, and you do it pursuant to a plan, that means you got to get through the process. You can you can you can sell that property uh, based upon the transfer tax exemption under 1146A, and uh, in New York City with a 3% RPT with New York City and and the state. 3% on, on $10 million is 300, 3% on $30 million is 900 and so forth. Now you can also use, uh, it gets a little bit more uh, complicated and it depends on if people are paying attention, but the buyer of a property who's getting financing to buy a property out of bankruptcy, you know, if you're smart, you can negotiate with the buyer to try to get him a mortgage tax exemption and some of that benefit can redound to the debtor. So there's a lot of side benefits in getting through a chapter 11 on a real estate side where you can save on transfer taxes. Now you can't go into a chapter 11 saying, I'm, I'm the only reason I'm here is to save on transfer tax. That, that, that's not a good faith filing. But it kind of, if you do it right, it can fall into your lap a little bit. And, 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 most, and most courts and even the city respects the fact that if you get through a bankruptcy and whether you sell it or refinance it, you can get that uh, tax exemption, which can be very beneficial. Now the offset that is people don't realize that they raised the U.S. trustee quarterly fees and now that's 1%. So if you're selling a piece of property at $30 million, you're going to have to pay a $300,000 quarterly fee, which is a, which is a, a chunk of money. And I believe it's capped at 250,000. Oh, yes, it is capped at 250, yeah. but but it is a chunk of money. 
Sure. Now we, we have a couple of minutes left. Uh, somebody put up a question and Lori, because I know that your firm represents a lot of hospitality specifically uh, with restaurants and hotels, I'm going to direct the question to you. Sure. Uh, and then I'll direct it to you, but Kevin will answer. So it's fine. Um, Perfect. <laughs> Should I answer before you ask right. it? <laughs> Take it away, Kevin. <laughs> so, so, so Laurie, the question is, do you see the hospitality industry, specifically restaurants and bars, using bankruptcy to shut down or liquidate for a short term and then come out with a fresh start after the pandemic? Meaning the same principles really just shutting down, stripping the liens or stripping the debt and starting fresh after the pandemic. I mean, that's not what it says, but I'm, I'm reading between the lines. Uh, well, I, I'm not quite certain what they mean by starting fresh. If you go out of business, you go out of business. And then well, if you reopen the business, you're gonna have their successor liability issues that are not part of today's so, presentation. So, so, so let's clarify so, that a little bit. Listen, so, so as I said, if you go through, you're not going to be able to get rid of all the debt, but I believe also uh, one of the things that now with the new subchapter five, mm -hmm. where the small business case, I think you can forcefully restructure the debt to a minimum for post uh, bankruptcy to be able to come out uh, working again. Is that, would that right. be? So, right. So there's this new subchapter five, uh, that governs smaller chapter 11 cases and it's kind of a hybrid uh, similar to a chapter 13 case where you pay your creditors over a period of, of three to five years and it's based on your excess net income. It also is a scenario where creditors don't have the opportunity to vote on a plan as they would in a traditional chapter 11 and potentially would uh, eliminate your ability to confirm. If you show your financials and that this is what you are able to contribute to pay off the creditors over a period of years, that's the plan. Uh, and that gives especially people in the hospitality industry that's been completely decimated by what's going on, potentially the ability to hang on and keep those businesses running. Okay, so, so that, that would be one of the solutions. I have not yet done a chap a sub chapter five. Uh, I'm in the middle of one. I'm, I'm in the middle of one right now. I'm not a big fan of them. I, uh, you know, I'm not a, just a big fan. I don't really think, you know, from a practical point of view, they help you very is that, much. Is that, is that because you don't understand it, Kevin? Or uh, I, I kind of understand it. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, reporting there. I understand it's small print, so I have a problem reading it. But having said that, here's the problem with it: you still have to pay your priority claims in full. And most restaurants have an issue with a lease and whether it's uh, a, a arrears on a lease or so forth, you got to cure and reinstate the lease. So it, you're not really going to gain much in a sub chapter five, as opposed to a regular bankruptcy. Uh, but, and, and, and bankruptcy for restaurants, the big, the big problem you got to deal with is a landlord. And so, you know, the bankruptcy court, you know, would like to see you be successful. And so maybe a bankruptcy judge can, can pressure a landlord to, to, to be reasonable in terms of what a cure is and the payoff on the cure and the restructuring of the lease. So I do see the benefit there. I think a, a basic chapter 11, even for uh, uh, a restaurant is still the better way to go. And, you know, it's a copycat type of situation. It started with the Models case. There are provisions that are suspending, not canceling, but suspending the payment of post-petition rent because of COVID. Uh, and you, you, you can make a case that that should be at least for 60 days. And then it, it becomes a question of negotiation. So you do get some, there's a potential for relief if you play your cards right. Uh, but... At the end of the day, when you're a restaurant, you got to deal with your, your landlord. You got to deal, a lot of them is taxing authorities. Both of those claims uh, have to be paid in full. So you're up against it in, in, when you're a restaurant. Okay. Um, so since Kevin spoke 85% of the time, uh, Jason and Lori, do you have anything to add before we wrap up over here? I'll, I'll say one thing real quick from a lender perspective. When you're in your 
when you're in your foreclosure negotiations or when there's a foreclosure, you're negotiating something. Be careful and don't piss me off too much. Me being the lender, because if you do, I'll come after you forever. And lenders will do that. And there's only been a couple of situations where that's happened. But as a lender, I've refused to give assignments of mortgages so that you could save on the tax savings through a plan. Um, and, and people do do that. So while you can have a bad relationship with your lender, try to have your counsel establish a good relationship with the other side, because it will actually, we can all benefit together if we do that. But if you burn that bridge, you're going to have a very, very unpleasant experience. And that's not good for you. It's not good for anybody. Lori? Well, kind of carrying forth from what Jason was saying in terms of, of debtors, don't have your head in the sand. See what's happening. Understand that you're going to need to work things out and see what you can do to work with your lenders and your other creditors, your landlords, whoever it is, to try to come to some sort of a consensual arrangement. Because when, when it becomes an emergency, it's a lot harder to deal with. And just like Jason said, lenders at that point, they're pretty pissed off. And if you approach them beforehand, it's potentially going to be beneficial for everyone. And all jokes aside, Kevin, what would you like to uh, part with? I would just uh, part with that uh, the stigma of bankruptcy, I think, is overrated. I think it's a very important tool for a borrower. Uh, I think it's a challenge to get through a bankruptcy case, but I think it can be, it can be accomplished. And I, I, I don't think you should look at bankruptcy as a failure. I think you should look at it as, as a tool to help. It's designed as a tool uh, to help borrowers navigate difficult times. And so I, I would embrace a Chapter 11. I wouldn't look at it as a failure or a chore or, or something to be afraid of. Uh, it's, got its, uh, it's got its issues you know, uh, that you're going to have to deal with going forward. But if, you, if, you, if your mind is there and your heart is there and you can come up with some money, you can be very successful. There's one question that popped up a couple of times uh, right before we uh, jump off uh, with the, the question of the deficiency judgments or the personal guarantees that we were talking about before. A few people asked, in experience, have you seen, uh, I'll put this to all three, uh, lenders going after deficiency judgments post uh, a sale of a property or recovery? Uh, and I'm going to say from my experience, I've seen it, but you have at what threshold do they actually go after it? Like, is there like a percentage or a dollar amount that would actually make them go after it versus not go after it? I, I've only seen it one time. And, and, and to what Jason said, I saw it one time and it was because the lender was pissed off at the borrower, not on the property where they, where they got the uh, deficiency judgment on another deal and they were holding a deficiency judgment for uh, a couple of years. And as a way to, you know, to tweak the borrower, uh, they went after him. But they, they, you know, that, that became subject to another years of litigation and they really didn't get any place. Other than personal, you know, spite, uh, a deficiency judgment after a successful bankruptcy is, is very rare. There's, there's provisions you can put in the plan that kind of cuts that off. And part of the negotiation would be that there's no claims against the guarantor. So you don't leave it on the table. You gotta be very careful when you, when you make your final deal with a lender to cover that. But most, most debtor attorneys do and most lenders go along with it. I mean, Lori, I, I know we were involved in a case where I was the, the restructuring officer and one of our, we'll call it joint clients, had a few cases that you worked on and a lender was going after him or two lenders were going after him and, and some other joint uh, guarantors for some time. Uh, have, I mean, if you want to explain something about that, not obviously with the specifics, and if you've seen it elsewhere. That's been my, my only ex experience where, and it's, uh, I don't want to use the word vindictive, but it is, it is a lender that just had it with this, this borrower who was playing games and was not really doing anything to help matters. And I think that's where the lender felt that they were just going to proceed against the individual. Uh, but otherwise, like Kevin said, you negotiate it, you work it out in the plan, you figure out a way to satisfy the 
lender in a way that they're going to walk away from that deficiency claim. And potentially there's going to be a, a nominal deficiency claim if the bankruptcy works out. Jason, just final words on that. And I think we're going to wrap up uh, as we've exceeded a lot of time. I think that the, it, it's rare to see you're only going to see something like that where you have a deficiency judgment if you try to cram a lender down and you're successful, which is a pretty hard thing to do anyway. Um, so generally speaking, well, you know, I don't doubt that Kevin or, or Lori has done it, um, but that's typically when, when, when you see that. So is, is the lender, if you can make the lender happy to walk away, if they, if they feel like they're getting paid enough and you don't have any really, really bad blood, you, you just don't see it. It's pretty rare. Okay, um, I think uh, that's going to wrap up for today. Mark, uh, Aaron, you want to? Any? Yeah, we'll just we'll just close it off. Thank you so much, David. This was really a great program, and thank you to all our panelists. Just a quick shout out to our primary sponsors: Riverside Abstract, Riverside Ten Thirty One, Riverside Tax. We'll send you all an email with information how to get in touch. Thank you again for joining us, and we really look forward to seeing you again soon in person. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.